A subscription to the China Africa Project's email newsletter is like getting a daily China Africa intelligence briefing delivered straight to your inbox every weekday at 6 a.m. Washington time. You'll get an in-depth review of everything going on in politics, trade, tech, culture, and more. And we don't just focus only on Africa, but also the Middle East and what China's doing throughout the Global South. Try it out free for 30 days. See if you like it. After that, subscriptions are just $7 a month for teachers and students and $15 a month for everyone else. Sign up today at ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Once again, that's ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa-China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, today, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi pulled together uh, foreign ministers from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh to talk about the unfolding crisis in India regarding COVID-19. And the reason why I think that's so interesting is because it really reflects the moment that we're in right now, where this was something that 20, maybe 30 years ago, the United States would have led the charge. There would have been a summit. There would have been quick action from the United States military to airlift resources in. Instead, the United States is dragging its feet it's going in reluctantly with aid to, to India. China was right on the money, very, very quick in responding to, to the crisis in India, almost within days offering vaccine support. The Chinese foreign ministry saying we're going to put aside some of our issues right now. And it really reflects in some respects the dexterity that the Chinese have shown in its vaccine diplomacy around the world, really taking advantage of the fact that the United States and Europe are just MIA. They're, they're absent. There's just a huge void that's being left of easy wins. Now, this is something that, for example, the United States could have been doing with 60, 70 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine that it's had in its storage in Ohio for a long time, and instead it has again been dragging its feet. And what we're going to talk about today is how the moment that we're in is reflected by just these incidents that I've detailed here and what it says about the diplomacy, the geopolitics of the era, and looking now towards the post-COVID-19 era, and I hate to say post-COVID-19 in part because I worry that that might in fact be premature given what's going on in India. We're in this really calamitous time. Also at the same time, the Chinese have been moving very quickly on debt relief. Uh, they've done more than any other G20 country, deferring somewhere around $2.1 billion. Again, you, in Africa, in our discussions on debt, we don't hear African leaders actually complaining about the Chinese in debt relief and debt restructuring. What we do hear is complaints about private creditors, even the multilaterals who haven't forgiven or restructured enough of those debts either. So in that sense, the Chinese have been very, very effective. However, looking at this moment right now, there does seem to be a change now that we're in the post-Trump era. In just the past two or three months since the Biden administration has taken office, listen to what the, some of the announcements that we've heard in terms of the creation of these alternatives to the BRI, these coalitions that are building up uh, against China. So the European Union and Japan just this week announced that they're going to launch an infrastructure uh, initiative to, uh, to rival the, the Belt and Road. The U.S. and Japan during their, the summit last week they made some announcements on that. U.S. President Joe Biden and U.K. Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson talked about building an alternate BRI. India and Japan previously have talked about building the Africa-Asia Growth Corridor, which went nowhere. There's, of course, the U.S., Japan, and India Blue Dot Network that was really kind of dead on arrival, but still is, is there in, in essence and could be reactivated if necessary. And of course, then there's the Quad, which is Japan, India, Australia, and the United States, which is much, much more active today than it's ever been. And then the Five Eyes, which is an intelligence coalition that includes Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the UK, and the US. 
And after a turbulent four years under the Trump administration, when it looked like the U.S. and European relationship was really on the verge of cracking, China is one of those rare issues that's now bringing both sides of the Atlantic back together again. Issues like Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Huawei, uh, trade, are all areas of alignment between the U.S. and Europeans when it comes to China. But we do have to be clear here that there are still some very significant differences. But on many of those issues, they are in agreement. And then in the United States itself, China is really one of the only issues that Republicans and Democrats can agree on. And it is absolutely remarkable in a society as divided and polarized as ours is, you can see that there is some consensus on China. We just saw that last week. The Strategic Competition Act came out of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. That's an act that's a bill to basically confront China with a lot of measures on Latin America and Africa included in the law. And it came out of the Senate committee with a 21 to 1 vote. Now, those are numbers on bipartisanship we just don't see anymore. So at the same time as China is moving very aggressively in the diplomatic and the geopolitical space, there are these big coalitions that are building against it. And we're going to try today to better understand where we are. But Cobus, where I'd like you to kind of contribute is in between these big powers moving, Europe, the United States, Japan, India, we have to think about the, the smaller powers and the middle states and the middle powers. And a lot of those are in places like Africa and throughout the global south. Yeah, the you know it's, it's it's very interesting to see all of these all of these movements happening from a, a kind of a global south perspective, because you know like I, I think in, in some kind of ways that it, there, there are echoes by w with some concerns from from the global south, but in but in other uh, but, uh, concerns from the global south about about like things that China China is doing here and there. But I think the, the 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 one of the big contrasts is that it's 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 frequently the same kind of set of powers kind of showing up for all of these different coalitions. You know, so for example, an actor like Australia, you know, is is, is involved in so many of them, and it is notable. I think that that ex for the, with the exception of India, not so many global South countries are involved, um, and also that that the 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 fact that you know that that it's always these kind of like this this little handful of of kind of powerful players. In you know, kind of inadvertently, kind of replicates the kind of exclusion of the global south. That that is one of the reasons why they're dealing with China to begin with. Um, you know, so so it's very interesting to see these kind of dynamics happening. At the same time, in a place like Africa. China is playing such a big role that, in a lot of ways, it's kind of demand that the that the, the global system kind of be be kind of reformed in order for China to be more of a norm maker, seems to kind of make sense in a way because simply because of the massive role that it plays in so many aspects of African society, and with it then the the kind of campaign against that has the implication maybe not one that that I think many Western Western partners would necessarily see, but I think in Africa it, it does. Have that implication of like, well, Africa will in 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 the process of kind of keeping China out of that norm making role, Africa will certainly never be in that norm making role. You know, so so that kind of the 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 kind of implications for the global south of the, of these kind of um, you know the, these these kind of block forming this kind of block forming you know kind of I think reads a little bit differently than than I think it does from the north. So the question on a lot of people's minds is, what does China want? Does China want to become a global superpower similar to what the United States is today? Does China want to become a regional hegemon just here in Asia and Southeast Asia? Does China want to change the norms and standards of the international order to its benefit? Uh, it's probably all or some of that, but there's not a lot of clarity, and the Chinese have not been very articulate about that. So we depend on analysis from outsiders to be able to tell us. And there is an excellent new book that really does try to string together some of these disparate pieces, How China Loses the Pushback Against Chinese Global Ambitions. It's by Luke Patey, who's a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies in Copenhagen. And if, by the way, Luke's name sounds familiar to our audience, it's because you might remember him from the book he wrote back in 2014, which is when we last spoke to Luke. The New Kings of Crew, China, India, and the Global Struggle for Oil in Sudan and South Sudan. A very good morning to you, Luke, and welcome back to the show after seven long years. Hi to both of you. It's great to be back, and thanks for having me. It's great to have you back. Congratulations on the book. I really enjoyed it. Let's dive right into it. I'm going to just hit you with a quote right off the bat, which I think represents your book. You said... 
China's approach isn't working. The global pushback against China's assertiveness is a consequence of both Beijing's strategic missteps and overreach. China's leaders are ill-prepared to accept economic and political compromise with the wider world, often viewing it through their own domestic authoritarian lens. They repel rather than attract potential partners to help fulfill strategic goals. That's going to come as a surprise to a lot of the people that Cobus was talking about in Africa who don't see the world the same way that you're characterizing it there. Why don't we start with this idea that China's approach isn't working in your view? Sure, that's a great question. Well, uh, that that line, I think, points towards uh, um, the issue that I think China at the moment, its current foreign policy direction, is in fact picking fights with a lot of the middle powers um, that you mentioned in your opening. So Japan, India, countries in the EU, the United States, of course, as, as a superpower at the same time. And that in itself, uh, I think, upsets the future trajectory of, of China's rise and China's global influence. And I, and I think, you know, what the book tries to do, firstly, is to make readers understand that we're not in a two country world. Right. That this is not the global affairs and the global economy won't simply be steered forward by the U.S. and China and the outcome of the current rivalry, that there are other players that matter. Right. The U.S. and China make up 40 percent of the global economy, uh, but there's still another 60 percent. The U.S. and China have the two world's most powerful militaries, but there are other powerful militaries out there, too. There are other tech leaders. There are other cultural hubs. And these countries will also be instrumental in shaping global issues uh, such as over, overcoming the COVID-19 pandemic, addressing climate change, what happens with trade and investment, and, and how technologies are going to shape our societies. And if we look at China's relationship with these middle powers, uh, Japan, India, Germany, we see fraying political ties, uh, new trade and investment barriers going up, and even security tensions. And to your question of why should countries in the global South care, uh, I think that they are attuned more than most others to, to the diversity of power that is actually out there in the world today, that they do not need to make a choice between China and the U.S., one block in the next or the next, but rather they can, they can choose from an assortment of partners. Uh, China is a new, uh, powerful one, for sure. It has considerable influence in the world, but uh, there are others out there. Uh, I saw this early on in my first book when Sudan, uh, in its oil industry, where China was heavily invested, uh, when Western companies left the country, Sudan didn't elect to just allow China to expand its stake in the oil industry, but it brought in India instead. Uh, today, we see this uh, in, in Africa uh, with, for example, the Tanzania, Tanzanian uh, standard gauge railway construction. China is a big player in that construction, but Tanzania is also working with Turkish and, and European companies to develop that infrastructure. So we've developed this mentality, I think, particularly when we study the global south, that China is, is omnipotent. It's everywhere. It dominates. But it doesn't. Uh, the reality is, is China is is a considerable power, right? It, in Africa, for example, it builds 30% uh, of the continent's infrastructure in recent years, but that leaves 70% uh, that's being constructed by African countries, companies from African countries, and companies from East Asia and companies from Europe. So I think uh, the Global South in particular is, is more attuned to this diversity of power that I write about in the book than I think we are in Europe and in North America. You start off the book in South Sudan. Um, and, you know, as, as you mentioned, your, your previous book also touched on South Sudan. So I was wondering, you know, like now looking back over the, the whole nightmare of South Sudan's civil war and, you know, the, a, a, lot of, a lot of how things have shaken out, including this, you know, the fact that China kind of, 
you know scratched its non-intervention um, principle to to get involved in in the peace negotiations in in in, in South Sudan. You know, in, in retrospect, the entire South Sudan experience is one of these very African kind of muddy experiences with no with with few kind of clear conclusions. A lot of kind of like one step forward, two steps back, kind of kind of you know meandering around around trying to kind of resolve civil conflict. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, you know, the situation situation in South Sudan is still not really, you know, fixed. Um, so I was wondering what, what you think China learned from their experience in South Sudan. I think that this, you know, South Sudan was, was, was firstly one of the first, um, I would say, Sudan and South Sudan uh, before the separation of South Sudan in 2011. This was really one of the first instances where China's non-interference policy was really challenged by events on the ground. That that China was a a first mover uh, in Sudan and South Sudan in investing in the oil industries there, but over the years uh, its investments got entangled uh, with local politics and and with conflict in those countries. And you know there's there's a number of things that that come out of it, but I think you know China cut its sort of crisis diplomacy teeth in in South Sudan. Um, it, 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 it sort of for the first time um, uh, was engaging in, in peace talks and, and, and conflict resolution. Um, but I, I, I'm still, you know, struggling to see if China has has learned all too much from this, uh, if the Chinese government has, because if we go back and we look at sort of Sudan and South Sudan today com- uh, and China's role in those countries compared to what it was uh, 10, 15 years ago, there's a stark difference. China has really pulled back from those countries. Uh, they, the, the oil investments, you know, have just simply been sort of set on, on pause. Of course, there's still some production, but China is not sort of engaging in these countries as as it once did. Uh, this This sort of idea or, or or even sort of hope that China would somehow build peace through its oil investments, through infrastructure investments in both countries, you know, hasn't panned out. Um, what we what we saw was China struggle like everyone else, uh, like the Americans, like the Europeans, struggling to to help make peace in the country. Uh, what we saw was sort of local actors basically taking control of the situation. Um, we saw, you know, Chinese oil companies uh, being targeted by rebel groups who were carrying Chinese arms that that entered the country um, through sales to the South Sudanese government, but then eventually were recycled in the conflict and ended up in rebel hands, and later targeted against Chinese investments. Uh, even South Sudanese soldiers, uh, in one incident, attacked uh, a UN mission in the capital Juba. And, and killed some Chinese peacekeepers. So we've seen that China's got bogged down in, in, this, in this conflict and really then in recent years has, has went hands off from it uh, and, and hasn't been engaging at the same level that it used to. Um, so I think you know, China is still in the process of learning of how to engage these environments uh, successfully. And we see it, it being challenged in Myanmar more recently uh, and and we'll see what happens in the coming years in Afghanistan. So still some lessons to learn, I th- think, for the Chinese. Well, let's stay with that idea of the lessons learned. And it's interesting to get your perspective because 10 years ago, when you were doing your research for the Sudan book, you were focused a lot on what the Chinese were doing in Africa very early on in China's engagement on the continent. Today, you're looking at China's presence more broadly, globally, in fact. Your book takes us to South America, it takes us to Asia, and of course, also to Africa. What are some of the lessons that China learned from its early engagement in Africa that you see kind of being carried out to places like the Americas and also here in Asia? What I see, to be, to be honest, is, is not necessarily um, lessons. This, this wasn't really sort of the focus of the research. It was more sort of the challenges um, that China is facing in, in these environments that its infrastructure is going into through, for example, the Belt and Road. So, I mean, I can touch on a few of those. Let's dive into the Belt and Road because I think that is, that's a big part of the book in that sense. So, yeah. But again, lessons in terms of both what they've learned and how they've applied that, but the pushback that's coming, they encountered that early on in Africa as well with people like Michael Sada in Zambia 
and, and, and there was a number of other characters in Africa who've also been very critical of the Chinese. So just again, talking about the pushback and some of the themes you brought up in your book. Well, I think, you know, w- one of the cases I look at, for example, uh, is is Argentina. And, and there, uh, there was a change of government back in 2015-16. And at the time, uh, China had a- around $20 billion of infrastructure finance uh, in the country uh, to develop railroads and, and hydropower dams uh, and, and, and subway systems in the capital, Buenos Aires. And at the time, um, there was a, a, a change from a, a government under Christina Krishner to, to the new president, Mauricio Macri, who was very critical of China's approach and worried that Argentina was uh, taking on too much debt. And, and sort of what we saw take place was that um, Macri was unable to, um, to sort of change some of the loans because of uh, some of the conditions within them. Uh, he wanted, to, for example, to cancel the hydropower dams uh, because he didn't see them as building the economy in the same way Christina Krishner did. Uh, but there was a cross-default uh, clause in this loan that made it so that if, if Macri, if Argentina canceled the hydropower dam, then he would also have to cancel the railway deals. Um, so those, both of those loans went ahead, but what uh, Argentina was able to do was to, ins- to lower sort of the, the, the level of the loans so that they didn't do as much uh, environment, they did, their environmental impact wasn't as strong, um, uh, that they lessened that, that, uh, uh, the damage, environmental damage that it would do. Uh, and they were, and they were able to, to ensure that more Argentinian uh, workers and companies were involved in some of these loans. So there was pushback from Argentine unions and the private sector to make sure that uh, China didn't Chinese companies and and Chinese products were not used uh, uh, um, to a large extent uh, in those projects. And this is something that we've seen carry on throughout the Belt and Road, not so much. In Africa, because its capacity in the construction industries is not as strong as other regions. But for instance, in Malaysia, when we had uh, the then Prime Minister Mohamed Mahathir also uh, lower some of the levels of the loans in renegotiating with China in big infrastructure projects such as high speed uh, railway, um, and at the same time push for um, those loans to include more domestic industry uh, rather than being completely conditioned towards uh, Chinese contractors. So the lesson here uh, that we, we should look for uh, in Beijing's future engagements through the Belt and Road is what's the level to which local industry actually gets involved in, in these financial arrangements? Normally, they're conditioned towards sort of three quarters or, or 80% or 90% is, is attached to uh, Chinese contractors and Chinese products being foot put forward for those product for those projects. Let's see if China will change those in the future and bring in more domestic industry because that's where I think China can actually play a stronger developmental role because these regions, particularly Africa, um, are going to need infrastructure uh, for decades to come, and it, I think it's critical that it be it that it's African companies, African construction companies, or Latin American construction companies, or Asian construction companies that are ultimately doing that work rather than than foreign ones. We had this conversation with Bradley Parks from Aid Data, who did a lot of research on this new loan database where they looked at the contracts for these projects, and including the one in Argentina. Isn't the issue less about the Chinese and more about host government agency and negotiating better with the Chinese? I mean, the Chinese are going to go out and negotiate the best deal they can get. That's their job. But at the end of the day, it's up to Argentina. And like what Prime Minister Mahathir did here in Southeast Asia and Malaysia, he negotiated hard. And what happened? He brought the price down of the railway by four or five billion dollars. But that's that's really the burden is more on the host government to negotiate better rather than on China. It depends how you look at it, right? China is selling the Belt and Road as a win-win uh, promise for partner countries. So China wants to see positive outcomes from the Belt and Road. But you're exactly right that it, the, the, at the end of the day, it's the host government that uh, should take these decisions, should ensure that their industries uh, are, are, are involved. So in the Argentina case, 
um, it was actually not the host government uh, that that was pushing for this, but labor unions and the private sector that said to the to the government, "Hey, we can do this work. Uh, yes, we don't have the finance here in Argentina. We can't get it from other uh, international lenders. China's the only game in town for these big projects, but we can do the work." So they pushed uh, to get some of that labor, some of that contracting. Um, in in Malaysia, yes, you had a very active. Uh, leader who 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 was also pushing for those those agreements. So in a sense, it's it, yes, I completely agree. It's up to uh, the 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 country uh, in question to push for that, and I think it's up to that country to recognize that China actually has an incentive for for these industries domestically to also grow because it wants to be able to go to uh, to its home audience and to the international audience and say, look. We're helping to develop these countries. These aren't white elephants. Uh, these projects are pr- producing, uh, you know, new trade and investment activity locally and internationally for these countries. And it that I think you know will offer some negotiation space to uh, even African governments that, as you as you know, don't have that capacity. There is that political incentive for China to offer a piece of the cake. Uh, in in producing these projects, expanding the the view a little bit more widely, um, the you know, one one of the big themes one sees a lot in in contemporary kind of American comments on on the rise of China is that China wants to replace the U.S. as a superpower, and there is this kind of counter narrative where many people actually dispute that very issue and saying that China actually isn't particularly kind of interested in 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 taking over this this kind of global well global policeman or global you know kind of global kind of power role that the U.S. is playing. At the same time, you also mentioned that China has learned a lot from from some of these these kind of American-led interventions, particularly the NATO intervention in Libya and the American-led in- invasion in Iraq. Like, what what kind of what, what kind of lessons did China learn from those? And and what you know, how is it thinking about its own kind of future superpowerdom? I I would say that you know from the incidents in in Libya and and elsewhere in the Middle East and Africa, you know China realized that it it it, it needs to have you know greater infrastructure, uh, uh, military infrastructure available to protect its investments, uh, its citizens uh, who are working abroad, um, in order to bring them home during these crises, um, and I think, you know China China has that as a result, steered away from its sort of non-interference policy. Um, f- uh, it's also sort of after years of saying it would never uh, have a military base abroad, it, it built a, a large one in Djibouti. Um, and it's it's sort of, we've seen, you know, uh, indications that it has other military outposts uh, in Central Asia, in Southeast Asia as well. Um, and so it, it realizes it needs to have sort of a, a, a military that can reach overseas, uh, f- for instance, to protect uh, its citizens and investments. And, and this, of course, doesn't mean that, you know, China will develop uh, hundreds, you know, I think it's the number is something around over 800, you know, military bases and installations as the U.S. does. Um, but it does mean that we will see a more active uh, Chinese military uh, in all parts of the world because its investments uh, have reached uh, across the globe, so I think China is keen to 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 protect those investments in 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 the coming years. Um, what I what I think it may struggle with is at this it's struggling in its relationships with with the middle powers at the moment and and finding common ground uh, in in settling some of these conflicts in the long run um, in in the Sudan's uh, in Syria um, that is, I think, challenged at the moment and produces instability for everyone. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa-China Reporting Project at the Witts University Journalism Department in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at WitzChinaAfrica or visit africachinareporting.co.za. One of the aspects of Chinese foreign policy that perplexes a lot of observers is how many Arab 
Muslim majority and African countries have been so compliant with China's core interests on issues ranging from Xinjiang to Hong Kong, uh, even to COVID-19. And you talk to people in Washington, Brussels, London, and they just can't get their head around why Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Chad, even Malaysia, Indonesia are just not taking stands, for example, on the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And it's been very perplexing. You write that China, and I'm quoting here again from your book, China weaponizes its trade, investment, and finance to punish and coerce countries, multinational corporations, universities, and non-governmental organizations that fail to respect its foreign and defense policy. And that reminded me of the the Chinese saying, kill a chicken to scare the monkeys. It's a a commonly used uh, phrase. And in this case, the chicken is Australia or Canada, but mostly Australia right now. And countries who are Muslim majority see the Xinjiang issue, for example, and they go, no one in my own constituency is pressuring me to take a stand on Xinjiang. So why do I want to piss off the Chinese and risk what's happening to Australia? And so therefore, I'm going to stay quiet or I'm even going to sign on to the Chinese because I don't want to cross them and and be the subject of this course of diplomacy. Can you expand a little bit on this idea of how China treats countries that do cross its red lines? Yeah, I think over the last, I would say, 10, 15 years, we've seen a growth in China using economic coercion uh, to, to pressure the foreign and security policy decisions of a host of countries, but primarily countries in, in the West uh, and in East Asia. Um, so as you mentioned, Australia, Canada, uh, but also in, in recent years, South Korea has, has received such trade pressure from China, uh, Japan before it, uh, among others. And I think, you know, China is, is, is testing out um, whether it can influence uh, these foreign and security policy decisions through applying this type of, of economic pressure. Uh, but I think what's what's critical to recognize is that China has yet to go down the road that the U.S. has taken when the U.S., for example, puts uh, comprehensive or, or you know, very wide ranging sanctions on Sudan, for example, for several decades or Iran uh, or others. China is is really targeting certain industries uh, and they're they're usually industries that ensure that China's interests uh, won't get upset too much because trade, of course, is a two-way street. Uh, and there are industries that China hopes uh, that you know, the, the media uh, attention towards targeting those industries will, will push uh, decision makers in, in, in those foreign capitals uh, to change their approach. But there's a couple lessons that I think have came out of this um, in recent years that might be instructive for those countries in the global south um, in terms of their own foreign and security policy decision making and and possible futures where they may also come uh, uh, in conflict with China on certain certain issues. Uh, The first is that uh, we shouldn't exaggerate the impact of China's economic coercion. As I said, it's often narrow in targeting. So even with Australia, uh, I'll, I'll use the Australian and ca- Canadian examples. So even with Australia, early on, the media was saying that, you know, 20, 25 billion dollars of trade across all sorts of products from from beef, barley, wine, coal had been targeted. Um, but in the end, after sort of a, a, around, you know, almost a year of, of, of being targeted, you know, only, you know, several billion or up to five billion uh, dollars in exports have actually been upset. So China doesn't sort of go after all the products that it trades with, uh, with countries. For instance, it never targeted Australian iron ore, which makes up a large amount of Australia's exports to, to China. In the Canadian case, it targeted a number of products, but it pulled back on targeting pork because the African swine flu in China had wiped out so much of China's pork industry that it pulled back from targeting Canadian pork because it needed that for its own market. So China, you know, puts on this light pressure. um, And we even see some products 
such, such as Canadian canola oil that was targeted by China, go through third markets to enter China. Um, so the, the, the main point here is that th this economic impact isn't as strong as I think the media uh, often portrays it as, and that there are not only, you know, not only can China find alternative buyers for the goods that it might be targeting, like buying Canadian barley after targeting Australian barley, but those targeted countries can also find alternative places to sell their goods. Uh, and we've seen that, for example, with India offering a, a market for Australian coal after it was targeted by China. Uh, Japan, the Middle East, Southeast Asia have been taking other goods from Australia that have been targeted. So this is, you know, for countries in the global south, uh, when China targets uh, countries in the west or its neighbors in East Asia, this can often be an opportunity, uh, such as South African wine has experienced when Australian wine was targeted. Um, there might also be long-term op opportunities for African for the African mining industry, for example, in iron ore, as China looks to diversify its supply from Australia. But it's also a lesson that China likes trade and investment too. China wants to maintain its economic growth too. It's actually quite sensitive to upsetting that growth. And it will uh, pull back. It will sort of only target for a limited time. It won't do what the Americans have done. And, and apply comprehensive sanctions. We haven't seen that in China's toolbox as of yet. But it's interesting because the, the sanctions against Australia have been actually counterproductive for China because the cost of iron ore has gone up. So Australians are actually making more money off their iron ore today than they were prior to the tensions. And at the same time, they're now importing South African coal, which is more costly and dirtier. So China's paying a price on that in, in, for, for some of their, uh, their actions towards Australia. Kobus, go ahead. Well, you know, w one, of the, one of the core issues that you, that you raise is this need for China to, um, to, to deal with the, the fact that, you know, as it expands into the world, it has more and more assets and more and more citizens kind of exposed to dangers overseas. Um, and we're seeing that particularly at the moment in, in West Africa, where there's, there's been this real spate of kidnappings of Chinese, um, Chinese corporate executives and, and other kind of, you know, kind of ex expats in Nigeria, a lot of kidnapping of, of Chinese fishing um, and piracy of Chinese fishing, fishing crews in, um, in the Gulf of Guinea. So I, I was wondering, you know, like you mentioned, you mentioned the base that China built, but, but of course, you know, there's a, there's a limit to how much, to how much kind of military, you know, kind of engagement one, one can engage in in the rest of the world. Like how, how does China go about um, protecting these other kinds of people and, you know, kind of scattered across the global south i think it, it it will come to the realization that it, that it can't um that ch you know so many chinese companies and citizens are working abroad that they are going to run into trouble in in unstable regions and, and and countries um you know I, I think this this mentality that you know china is a monolith and, and can protect its people everywhere um is 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 wrong i mean it it's it's going to face i think you know, consistent insecurity. Um, where I think you know, China can 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 sort of have a a, a positive effect, um, and and to ensure its 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 people and investments can stay safe is that you know if the international community somehow can can coordinate more on on these types of uh, uh, conflicts, whether in in South Sudan or Myanmar and and Syria, and that of course is is seems to be a pipe dream at the moment, considering uh, relations between the U.S. and China and 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 frayed relations between China uh, and, and other uh, middle powers. But I think that's that's where we need to head. Uh, I think we need to recognize that there are, for instance, in South Sudan or or uh, in other sort of unstable regions, there are common interests between. The U.S. and China and other outside actors, uh, and I think you know, the special envoys, for example, the dip, the top diplomats that both China and the U.S. Uh, sent uh, to South Sudan, they saw this right. Liu Guajin and and his, and his successor Zhang Jinghua, and 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 then on the American side, Princeton Lyman and Donald Booth, they were eager to work together and cooperate and and do their best to help. The South Sudanese and, and uh, settle their conflicts, um, but I think their hands were often tied by uh, 
geo, geo, the bigger geopolitics, uh, the decision makers in Washington and Beijing uh, that were more concerned uh, and worried about the bigger picture and wanting to compete with the Americans or compete with the Chinese and not trusting the other side. So I think we're we're going to need to um, to to push more to find those sort of common positions that that both countries can can gain from in in places like South Sudan. But do you really think that there's room for for any kind of common ground here, given the fact that the Chinese feel under attack from the United States and now from the British Parliament, who accuse it of being a genocidal power? I mean, there's not a lot of gray area when one country says you're committing genocide to then say, okay, we can put that aside and we'll work together on climate change or on peace in South Sudan. Seems like that's a hard thing to get over. Totally agree. I think it's a, it's a long way uh, to go. Um, one, can, one can hope that at, at a lower level, somehow out of the spotlight, that uh, embassies can cooperate together, that, uh, for example, uh, you know, there's a British... NGO called Safer World that was working with large Chinese oil and mining companies in dealing with security issues and corporate responsibility issues in uh, conflict prone countries in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, these sort of we can only hope that these sort of lower level uh, engagements and, and, and partnerships can can be maintained. But I agree, uh, it, it's it's pretty you know dismal at the moment. Uh, the, the broader picture. One of the things that that always kind of interests me about about the the expansion of China in the world is that, in so many ways, you know, obviously China is this kind of massive powerhouse, is huge, but but in in so many ways, its culture is so insular and so specific um, that it always kind of surprises me a little bit when when people kind of accuse China of, of trying to export its model overseas simply because its model seems so kind of tailored to its particular realities. Um, so I was wondering like just just as a very kind of broad broad question but you know where do you, what kind of cultural changes do you think is gonna is gonna take place in China in order for it to adapt to this kind of greater global presence because it seems like as it's as as you say, like as it as it kind of expands into the world, it increasingly seems to see everything in the world through its own kind of domestic lens, and and its own domestic lens is, is super shaped by the concerns of the of the party itself and within the within within it, Xi Jinping himself. So you know, so so how what kind of cultural shifts will have to happen in China to in in order to take on this kind of global role? It's a great question. I, I, I fear I don't have uh, the best answer for it. It's not something I've looked at in depth. Um, but I would say, you know, as China uh, encounters problems, as its investments get upset, uh, as its um, people, uh, workers at different companies come uh, into harm's way, that's where I've noticed uh, uh, an openness on the Chinese side to uh, engage uh, outside actors that it normally wouldn't. Um, for example, um, a, China, a large state-owned oil company, China National Petroleum Corporation, you know, for years this company uh, was not uh, engaging in, in cor much corporate responsibility uh, overseas where it invested. It, it sort of had a hands-off approach to engaging local societies. It didn't see sort of the... Uh, the point in doing it, but after it faced you know kidnappings, after it faced insecurity, it it opened up. Uh, it started to speak uh, with with local NGOs, with uh, local political leaders, religious leaders uh, in in different countries uh, in South Sudan, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. And it even started working with uh, uh, Western. NGOs, uh, Western political risk consultancy groups that had some experience in these areas. So I think, you know, it, a lot of it might be driven um, by the interest uh, of Chinese companies and, and, and the Chinese government in realizing that it, it can expand its trade and investment if it, if it does sort of uh, uh, have a more open approach. Uh, and we've seen, I think, you know, Western, large Western companies go through this learning curve as well, with, and it hasn't been entirely realized. But uh, I think China, Chinese companies are, are headed in that direction as well. Your book is quite critical of China throughout, in, and I would say in a very constructive way, interesting way. But nonetheless, 
Uh, it is critical. But you surprised me a little bit towards the end where you said the world cannot afford for China to lose. And we almost need China to win because if it loses, it's going to bring everybody down with it because of its sheer size. Talk to us about your conclusions and, and that concept that we need China to succeed here, at least in some form. Well, you know, with this book, uh, I was, you know, it where it really came from was the idea that um, many of my, you know, colleagues uh, here in here in Europe, but also I would say in the U.S., tended to argue one extreme or or the other where China was concerned. Either you know we were being you know overly aggressive and assertive towards China, and 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 we were sort of creating a, a self fulfilling prophecy that we would come into sort of. Uh, confrontation and conflict with China, or we were naive and, and, and didn't understand, you know, that China was expanding its, its global presence and, and um, you know, upsetting democracies around the world. And I wanted to sort of point out that, you know, there was a lot of space in between those two extremes and that, you know, we needed to engage China on many issues, including uh, on addressing climate change, and needed to be open to working with them. Uh, we needed to recognize that uh, China has, uh, you know, dramatically improved the welfare of its population. Uh, and that if, you know, a large population, um, one fifth of, of, of humanity. Um, but at the same time, uh, we needed to put up uh, those barriers where we didn't want uh, China's influence uh, in our own uh, societies. We didn't want China to to dictate what protesters, for example, in Europe could 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 demonstrate against, what films could be shown uh, at at film festivals, um, and and these types of incidences have been growing of late in Europe. So there there's a there's a need to find a middle ground, uh, and that's where I suggest. Um, that countries do need to think, uh, you know, outside of the bilateral when when China's where China is concerned, that they do need, particularly small states and middle powers, do need to work collectively to to negotiate with China, whether it is on on trade and investment issues or on on China's uh, political influence in their societies. So I was really trying to to strike uh, uh, find some middle ground. Uh, between what I what I see as as sort of uh, two very uh, extreme positions on China, the book is how China loses the pushback against Chinese global ambitions. It is available on Amazon, where you can get it for the very reasonable price of nine dollars and ninety nine cents in a Kindle. As as regular listeners of this show know, I complain bitterly about these great books coming out from scholars and academics, which are $85. This one is actually accessible. Again, go to Amazon.com, How China Loses the Pushback Against Chinese Global Ambitions. Uh, it's written by Luke Patey, a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies in Copenhagen. Uh, Luke, thank you so much for taking the time to tell us about the book. Congratulations again on it. It's really a wonderful read, very insightful. If people want to follow what you're reading and writing and to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? I'm on Twitter at Luke Patey, P-A-T-E-Y, and they can follow what I'm publishing and, and, and focused on there. Fantastic. We'll put a link to the Amazon link in the show notes as well as to Luke's Twitter handle as well. Thank you so much, Luke, for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure. Kobus, the only thing that I didn't like about Luke's book was the title. To me, I think it sets the wrong impression about what the book is actually about, how, how China loses, because that is that binary type of framing that he, that he was saying he wanted to get away from. And actually, his book is far more nuanced than the title suggests. And I fear that a title like that is something that will turn off a lot of Chinese readers, for example, or people who support the Chinese, because the book is actually really important reading for Chinese stakeholders to better understand how they are perceived in the outside world and some of these issues articulated in a very nuanced way by somebody who's been following these issues for more than a decade. This is not the kind of knee-jerk polarization, the anti-China crowd. But again, I think publishers oftentimes make the book titles. It's They want to sell books. So they the only way to sell books is China sucks. That's a great way to sell books. We're going to go and put the title on. But I thought that title was misleading. So I hope that people listening to the discussion 
with Luke will see how it's far more nuanced and textured than the title suggests. But And I think that's what's so important. And what he said at the beginning of the discussion is absolutely critical, that the media narratives that we hear about the Chinese in places like Australia, in Europe, and including in Africa, oftentimes are so superficial to the point of being counterproductive. So that's why this book is really important. And I hope that people in Washington are reading it, and I hope people in Beijing are going to read it as well. It was a very interesting project for me, and you know, in in that he he kind of refuses this kind of global north, global south split that that we see frequently in relation to China. Obviously, we tend to focus a lot on the global south, um, and a lot of other people, like a lot of like, uh, of you know, kind of like American think tanks and so on, like focus a lot on on specifically on the global north and, and don't particularly talk about the global south. So it was interesting for me to see in one book him, you know, kind of dealing with places like South Sudan, and then you know also with places like Germany you know so so it was, it, it, that, that kind of mix of, of things and showing how, how the kind of how China is, a, is an actor dealing with all of these kind of d- different countries at once was was really fascinating he brought up an issue in the book and we just didn't have time to get to everything that I wanted to ask him but he talked about how the fact that China doesn't compromise in its dealings with smaller countries he said without reform and adoption of a genuine openness and to compromise and cooperation, then he said uh, this will undermine rather than advance Beijing's standing in the world. And that's an issue that I think is so important. And we've seen this time and time and time again. We had that conversation a couple of weeks ago about Chinese fish in Kenya and how even on an issue that is so small economically to China, it didn't compromise. It's never compromising when it comes to these smaller countries in the global south. And that's where I think China will, if it doesn't adapt and evolve beyond that and actually make some compromises, it's going to run into big problems. Some would say, for example, that it's debt suspension and debt deferrals are compromises, but at the end of the day, it's not eliminating the debt. It's not removing the burden. A compromise in this case would be, you made some bad financial decisions, we made some bad financial decisions, let's negotiate a settlement that makes it easier for everybody, rather than simply say, you're gonna pay us back in full, it's just gonna be 30 years later than we originally planned. So real compromise and concessions would be very interesting to see if they can evolve into that. Yeah, it's also you know the 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 example of Argentina was was quite interesting for me and and I think troubling in, in some ways is that you know that the the de- the deals are so inflexible that they can't deal with these democratic transitions in other countries, particularly the the kind of messy democracies that one 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 finds in, in the global south. And if you can't deal with that, then that makes you a very rigid actor, you know. Um, and particularly if it, it also makes it very difficult for you to, to deal with environmental pushback, which which I think I think Luke rightly points out is one of the kind of major factors in China's dealing with the global south. As, as we see more and more of these major projects in Africa, we're also seeing more and more kind of concerted environmental and community pushback against them. And if you are if you are a kind of a global power like China, which where one of your one of your core core features is that you tend to be quite weak on, on things like environmental impact assessments then you know the combining that with a, a total rigidity on 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 loan contracts means that it makes it very difficult for for countries in the global south who also don't have a great kind of you know tracking of, of environmental impact to to kind of to to adapt the the um, the project to make it less invasive or you know less impactful on local communities i think that is a real kind of like perfect storm of different countries' weaknesses kind of hitting each other and and leading to really bad kind of project outcomes. I'm not holding my breath that they're going to compromise for environmental considerations or any other concern, only because the reading that I get of the mood in Beijing in the foreign policy establishment is that they feel very much under attack in a defensive crouch right now, that they feel that the coalitions are building around them. I listed those at the beginning of the show that the United States is mobilizing an alliance of friends and allies in Europe, in Asia, and in other parts of the world. And I think that they feel that if they concede or compromise now, even on small issues, that it will make them look vulnerable. And Xi Jinping, at the end of the day, cannot look vulnerable for his own constituencies and his own narrative. And he's again, he's very Donald Trumpian in that respect. No compromise, no weakness. 
And so that's a little bit concerning. And maybe that's the title, How China Loses, is the fact that it, it will be rigid, it won't adapt, and it won't be compromising, could be problematic. That being said, the power of these coalitions that are forming around it, for now, appear very, very weak. The United States simply does not have the leverage and credibility that it had 40, 50 years ago when it built an alliance against the Soviet Union. And one of the things that we see out of the United States today is just one empty promise after another. So we had the Biden pledge to cut greenhouse gases by 50% in the United States. If anybody believes that, they're smoking something. Because at the end of the day, it's not a legally binding commitment. And the United States does not do treaties anymore. It's been 15 years, as I mentioned in a previous podcast, since the Senate ratified a treaty. And so these coalitions are built on rhetoric, but not actually on any substance. So I think in that sense, China just needs to wait them out. But that doesn't mean that underneath the surface of these coalitions, people aren't really angry and disillusioned. And Kobus, I guess the test for us and our audience in Africa is going to be FOCAC. And whether the Chinese come to FOCAC this year in Senegal with money and a plan for the next three years and real engagement, or do they come with rhetoric, a cutback in spending? Do they talk about digital and health, which are much lighter footprint? And I wonder if that will impact the perceptions of the Chinese, even among the governing elites who up until now have been very much in China's corner. I can well imagine that it would that it would impact their their views of China, but I don't necessarily think it would it would necessarily ruin the relationship um, because African countries have so few other options. You know, as as you say that the all of this talk of counter be our eyes. Um, you know, it's mostly talk. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of rhetoric there, and a lot of a lot of kind of like forward projection, and a lot of kind of like, wouldn't it be great if our companies work with these emerging economies? Wouldn't that be amazing? You know, like, and and Africa is like, yeah, it would, <laughs> but you know, um, like very little of it is happening on the ground. So, so you know, Af it's not only that Africa has limited choices; it's that China's very rise kind of calls into question some assumptions that I think this these kind of global North coalitions don't particularly want to face. Because there is a kind of a pecking order in you know in geopolitics that they don't necessarily feel particularly compelled to disrupt. So, you know, for example, I was making fun of the the concept of the quad today in our in the newsletter intro, you know, and against the back of this complete nightmare that's happening in India um, and, call, and just, just simply asking you know kind of like who you know what what counts for more for the US you know is it is it you know like loosening intellectual property rights in, in, in order to in, which is an issue that India has been pushing you know in order to, to to save millions of lives in India that it was currently kind of like floundering under under COVID-19 or to protect you know the bottom line of Pfizer executives at the moment, it's the latter, and so much for the quad. You know, it's like so. So it's that, it's that kind of thing. You know, kind of like if the, these 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 coalitions are fine, but 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 they don't take into account the the kind of the kind of class system of the global economy, you know, um, and the fact that China has come from on the, from the bottom of that class system, and therefore its rise itself kind of questions the entire system. And also a, a manifestation of what that reduced power structure looks like from the U.S. and Europe is in the form of the British aid budget, which slashed from last year $21.3 billion to $13.8 billion. And, and this goes to your point about whether or not African stakeholders have choice. So they may not like dealing with the Chinese, but the British now, one of the top three aid donors, simply is a lot smaller than it was last year at this time. And that's really the reality that is confronted out there. And by the way, just a quick heads up, everybody, on our website, we did a Q&A with Dr. Pippa Morgan from Duke Quinshan University, who is an expert both in Chinese overseas development assistance and UK aid. And she did a great analysis as to whether or not this is good or bad news. Guess what? It's both for the British and also in Africa about this cut in aid vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese. I really recommend you go to our website and check that out. That, by the way, is the kind of content that we feature in our newsletter. 
every week, every day, exclusive content, exclusive analysis. And what we're doing is we're providing it same day. So things are happening and then we get a Q&A from an expert like Pippa. Things are happening and we're getting things much faster than what they're appearing in the mainstream press. So we're picking up little details, pulling things out of Senate bills, for example, and going through and pulling all the China-Africa aspects out of that U.S. Senate foreign relations bill that just came out of committee and giving people a very quick heads up so you don't have to spend two, three hours kind of scouring through Google to find all of the good stuff. We do that for you. If you're interested in signing up for the newsletter, go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code podcast. We'll throw 20% off a lifetime subscription, and you can try it out for a month for free. See if you like it. If you don't like it, cancel anytime. So that'll do it for this edition of the podcast. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another show. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Yolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs>